Well, readings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, this sermon's for you. Amen. God called him and told him, you know, that while he was in the womb, God put his hand on him and capacitated him to be a prophet through the Holy Spirit. The same for you. Before you were ever born, when God was so forming you, his hand was upon you. So it's not by accident that you're here. And uh, I trust that you're here because you want to be with joy in your heart to the Lord. That's important all for all of us. That we're here with joy in our heart and praise and worship to the Lord. Now this sermon may not be a little easy for you. <laughs> it's not a rebuke or chastisement. The Lord began speaking to me on Friday and he all night, Friday night, spoke to me. And so yesterday again. And so we just dispraise him. He said, I want my people to look again, to understand and know how great I am. And he said, I'm their father. And you know, sometimes we get the, we get a little picture, but we don't get the greater picture. Oh, my, my father was uh, half Indian, and uh, he had some difficulties. He, it was hard for him to speak and communicate. And the first time he actually talked to me as a son was when I was what, 17 or 18 years old. Oh, he just, he could yell, he could be angry, but he couldn't open up and with love speak to me. And then I found out about the same time, maybe a little bit before that, I was going through some old pictures that mom had, and I saw my father in a boxing outfit and so forth, and he had won the um, featherweight championship of Canada. And I was shocked. I had never heard that or known that. I knew that he was very quick to get angry and very quick to <laughs> act, but I didn't. So there are things about God that we don't know. And he wants us to come to know him better and better. And then as we come to know a little bit about the awesomeness of God, he wants us to know that to his children, he's not an angry God. He's not a monster. He's not frightening. But he's a God of power and a God of love. And with all this power and greatness and so forth, he can very gently reach down and touch us wherever we are in our need and our hour. Uh, one of my little crazy stories, when I was in college, I was studying music. And I was studying violin this per at this particular time and I had to go the next day to a violin exam. And I wasn't ready for it. I knew I wasn't ready for it. There were just all kinds of, not only that, other things in my life that... And I, we had practice rooms, you know, a little tiny room with a piano and so forth. And I was in one of these practice rooms. And I didn't feel like practicing at all. And I knew I had to. And I started to pray, to cry out to God. And the Holy Spirit came. And he revealed, he opened my heart helped me to see my wretchedness and so forth. And I was crying out to God with all that was within me. And his presence came. He flooded that room. It was like I was almost pinned to the wall. But the glory, and the praise, the presence of God. And he heard me. Oh, this poor fellow made it through that violin exam. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that I was the best or anything, but I did it. And I have found that in so many situations of life, God has come in his fullness, in his power, and his blessedness. And he has delivered me. He has helped me. He has anointed me. He's God. He's my Father. 
my father. So today we're going to look at this and how many of you have your Bibles with you? Will you raise your hands? Okay, that's good. Uh, I'm going to take you through probably a whole lot of scriptures and we'll just get started. Okay, let's um, go to the book of Revelation. Who is Jesus? What is he like? What is our father like? Okay, here we are. Revelation 1. You've all read through this probably many, many times. But let's re read through it again together. John's on the Isle of Patmos. The Isle of Patmos is not a vacation center for him. It's a salt mine that goes down under the sea. And at 90 or a little more than 90 years old, he's in slave labor. You should understand that we're here. We're here as long as God wants us to be. And if we have the right heart, he will keep us here until we fulfill, fulfill all of his plan for our lives. If we don't give up. Many people give up. And they say, I'm ready to go. You know, and for years, that's what it is. I'm ready to go. As if they had nothing more to do and accomplish in life. But there's something for all of us to do and all of us to accomplish. You hear that, Jeremiah? God has something for you to do. Nobody else can do it. His hand is upon you to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. So as John is on this island and he is in the spirit, what does that mean to be in the spirit? Well, I know the opposite. I know what it is to be in the flesh. You get filled with wrong emotions, anger or whatever it is. That's the flesh. But to be in the spirit, where even though you're physically here on earth, your heart is reaching up to the very throne of God. Your heart is filled with adoration and praise and worship by the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's it. He's in you. Your body has become the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy God. Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now no matter where you are, in prison or on the street, you can have fellowship with him. Fellowship with him. Time's coming soon when many Christians will be in prison. Keep our focus. So there's John. And he's suffering it's extremely hot this is the mediterranean there probably a hot summer day it's uncomfortable but he's in the spirit and he's worshiping he's not focusing on the discomfort and the pain or whatever and god opens the heavens god begins to speak to him right where he is God begins to give him a vision. He says in verse 10, I was in the spirit. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. I was wrapped, lifted up in the power of God on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a great voice, like the calling of a war trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Maybe that voice was so wonderful that he was almost afraid to turn around. Who it is? No. It's God. And God says, write prompt, promptly what you see, your vision, in a book, and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum and Thyatira and Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. God in his mercy took me there. And I was able to visit five of these churches or the uh, remains where the churches had stood and the cities they were in and so forth. 
Then I, John, turned to see whose voice was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Before I see whose voice that is, there's something else. God is showing me that he's calling to my attention. These seven golden lampstands, and then in verse 20, the end of the verse, it says, the seven assemblies or churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So these seven beautiful, ornamented, golden lampstands are the churches. And the churches are who? They are the people of God. Whether there's a small group or there's a big group, whether there's seven or ten or a thousand, five thousand, Jesus is there in the midst of them. And we see that in verse 13. And in the midst of the lampstands, and like the Son of Man, clothed with a robe which reached to his feet with a girdle of gold about his rest. rest. His head and his hair were white like white wool, as white as snow. His eyes flashed like a flame of fire. His feet glowed like burnished bright bronze, as it is refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. This is the revelation. This is the glimpse that God, John had at the person of Jesus Christ. What is he like? Who is he? He's this majestic one. Again, reading from verse 14 or, or 13. He's wearing a robe to his feet with a girdle of gold about his breast. His head and his hair were white like white wool, white as snow, and his eyes flashed like a flame of fire. His feet glowed like bright burnished bronze as it is refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, now we're going to look at some other descriptions of <coughs> Jesus. First, let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel seven thirteen. I saw in the night visions, and behold, on the clouds of the heavens came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So he comes to the Father, and he's presented before the Father. And there was given him the, to the Messiah dominion and glory and kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom which shall not one that shall not be destroyed hallelujah we're going to later talk about the relationship between jesus and his father let's go to ezekiel chapter 1 verse 28 Yes. We don't have an extra Bible, do we? That we here. There's one back there. Okay. No, yeah, we do. Yes, uh, Jeremiah needs a Bible. Hmm? Ezekiel one. Yeah. He's going to hear all these glorious things. 
but he can't see them if he doesn't have a Bible. Hmm. What is that? No, we're in verse 28. Uh, one. No, let's um, start a little earlier than that. Let's go all the way back to 26. Above the firmament that was over their heads was like a throne in appearance, like a sapphire stone seated above the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man. From what had that appearance of his waist upward, I saw a luster, as it were, glowing metal with the appearance of fire enclosed round about and within. From the appearance of his waist downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire. There was brightness of a halo round about him. And the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one speaking to me. In the book of Revelation also, in chapter 4, of course, we see the throne of God. And underneath the throne are these cherubim, these magnificent, magnificently beautiful, beautiful creatures. And uh, well, there, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 5, they had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces, and each one had four wings, and their legs were straight legs, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled in burnished bronze. Well, verse 1, uh, chapter 1, verse, I'm going into 8. These cherubim, and they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and the four of them had their faces and their wings. Their wings touched one another. They turned not when they went, but they went everyone straight forward. Now here are these four cherubim, and they are holding up a floor, a pavement, and... This pavement is like one humongous, beautiful, sparkling, dazzling sapphire stone. And between these cherubim is a fire, a living fire. And these supports legs for the throne of God and for that sapphire stone protect the holiness and the presence of God, as well as holding up and supporting this uh, floor on which the throne of God sits. They are the cherubim. Then we find uh, God sitting on his throne on top of this floor, and then above the throne we see the seraphim, four of them round about also, flying and speaking one to another, perhaps singing, declaring the holiness and the beauty and the glory of God. It's a beautiful sight. It's a magnificent sight, the presence of God. In uh, Psalm chapter twenty. In 18, I think it is, Psalm 18. Are you there? Verse 1. David says, I love you fervently, devotedly. Oh, Lord, my strength. Where are you? Psalm. 18, verse 1. 
when you have been through a situation or a battle and God has brought you through it, you have come out of it and you are overwhelmed with gratitude, with praise, with worship. You're like David here as he cries out to God, Oh Lord, I love you. I praise you. you know, can you imagine, Peter, there's been a storm. The waves in the Sea of Galilee are high and mounted up. And when I say high and mounted up, I would imagine at least uh, two meters, three meters maybe. And they have swamped the, the boat. And these, uh, Peter and James and John, they're fishermen. They're used to that sea. They're used to these storms. And that's nothing normally to them, but this was exceptional. It was really difficult. And another time, Peter gets out and he walks on the water to Jesus. and looks down. <laughs> he says, ah, I'm walking on the water. Uh, the realization in him of where his flesh was. And he's going down and down. Lord, save me. And he did. He reaches out his hand. He takes Peter. Lifts him up. How did they get back to the boat? Peter walked on the water with Jesus. If you walked on the water with Jesus, you've been through tough things. Jesus give you a hand. Did he give you strength? Make you an overcomer. And he walked through the thing with you. He walked through the thing with you. Many years ago, God bless Joan and I with twin boys. And then he was so lonesome for them and he missed them so much that he took them back to heaven to be with him. Joan was still in the hospital, and she'd been through a great ordeal, was weak. And the doctor came, and he said, we have a young mother who has just given birth, her first child, and the child died. And he says, I'm going to lose her if we can't do something to help her. She's in such grief. And she said, would your wife go? and talk to her. So they brought in a, a, a gurney, a stretcher type thing, and they carried my wife into the room with that young mother. And Joan wrapped her arms around her and held her and said, I know. I understand. We had just lost two. Jesus wraps his arms around to us and whatever we're going through. And he says, I know. I'm here. I've been through it too. And he was. He was through all kinds of situations that we don't read about. You go to Israel and, you know, right beside the Sea of Galilee, are these high hills, these mountains rising up. That's where they slept most of the time. Yeah. It wasn't just Jacob that had a stone for a pillow. No. Maybe they, but they didn't carry suitcases, so they didn't have an extra blanket or something. They had to just pull up on one of those stones. He, he, Jesus had to contend with the moaning, groaning, fighting of all the disciples. Maybe they, after a while, tried to keep him from hearing it, but they knew how to communicate with one another. And they say, well, she really got us into a situation here. We haven't had any food. And if you had to climb in those hills for five miles, to the nearest village, 
I'm sure there were many times that they didn't have food and maybe didn't have water. Certainly didn't have a shower or a cake of soap. <laughs> These are little things we take for, for granted and we have a tendency to mumble, to grumble about everything and to find it doesn't please us. We would like to have better. Jesus says, I understand. I've been there. I've done that. Keep focus. You're a child of the king. Don't let any of these things disarm you. Don't forfeit your joy and your peace. I'm with you. If you're in love, you can go through anything, can't you? Oh, it's nothing. You're in love. Be in love with Jesus. That's what he wants us to do. All the time. Not just part of the time. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I think we read that one already. No. Uh, chapter 7, verse 9. Now, yeah. go back up a little bit. I kept looking until thrones were placed for the successors of the judge. In the ancient of days, God, the eternal Father, took his seat, whose garment was white as snow, hair of his head, like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame. Its wheels were burning fire. In verse 10, a stream of fire came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand rose up and stood before him. It's a scene in heaven. I have to confess there's so many things I don't see, I can't understand. These worshipers and praisers before the throne, Revelation 4, 5, are there continually falling down, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And we're in flesh, we're human. And I thought, don't they get tired of that? No. After you've been there for an hour or two and you're falling down and crying out, holy, 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 now it's time to go to the nearest restaurant, isn't it? <laughs> no. But no, things are going to change. We're not going to be the same. Our desires won't be the change, same. And our capacity to worship and to appreciate the beauty of God, to see him, will change. It will be more intense than it's ever been before. And whatever he would desire of us, we will be more than willing to give. But looking at this and we see this fire, he himself, looks like from the waist up like there's a fire within him and from the face waist down there's a fire also and then it says in verse 10 a fire streams forth from before him our god is a fire isn't he he's like a fire he's he has a form because he created adam and eve in his form and yet they're earthly they're of the earth we're of the earth we have a human body we have a mind we have a, a spirit a soul a spirit and a body 
But God is a spiritual being. And he manifests when in this glimpse that Daniel has, he sees him as a being that's full of fire. Yet he has on a long white robe that goes all the way down to his feet. Later, we're going to see that there are many heavenly things that are incomprehensible to us in our world of knowledge and experience. They're in another dimension. They're beyond us. But they're reality. And this reality lets us have a glimpse of God so that we will also understand that we are his children and we're going to be changed and we're going to be similar to him. We will never be God, but we shall bear that spiritual image and body in a sense. It's wonderful who he is, the creator of the universe, the one who is watching the tiny little bird that falls to the earth and being mindful of it, but at the same time who stretches forth a hand or a finger and a volcano explodes and goes 10 miles into the air. He's an awesome God. He's mighty God. And he's our father. And he doesn't want us to fear him. He wants us to have a love relationship, a love for him and a reverential respect and honor that he is God. But what he has to say is important. It's above everything and everyone else. And we need to listen and look and obey our Heavenly Father and not be so mindful of everything here on earth and what's going on round about us. These people who don't know him, they are under these physical laws and all of this stuff. But we aren't. We are free. We're free in the Spirit. And if we obey the Holy Spirit, we will be free in every way. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let's look in Daniel 10, 5. Here again. I lifted up my eyes and looked and behold a man clothed in linen whose loins were girded with pure gold of Euphaz. His body also was a golden luster like burl. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes like flaming torches. His arms and his feet like glowing burnished bronze and the sound of his words was like the noise of a multitude of people or a roaring of the sea. Wow. The priests also were white linen, didn't they? Revelation tells us that that's the righteousness of the saints to be dressed in white garments. Hallelujah. You know, there's this physical body and there are these physical things that with which we are clothing the body, but we're also a spiritual person. We're a spiritual body. And there's a spiritual clothing that we don't normally see with our eyes. I, used, I had the joy, the privilege as a child of going back and forth to Catherine Kuhlman's meetings, if some of you have heard about Catherine Kuhlman. She walked in an anointing that was very, very special. She loved beautiful clothes, as you know. Wore these long white dresses down to the floor, the gowns, and so forth. But there was something else that you felt and you didn't see. It was like an electrical presence with her. We would stand outside of, of Carnegie. Carnegie Hall 
Thank you, dear. In the winter time, 20 degrees below zero or more, we'd stand there for a couple hours because we'd have to get there around five to six o'clock to get in. And there would be all these people gathering, several thousand people gathering out in the street, either in the freezing, in the snow, or in the rain, or sunshine, whatever. Rarely sunshine, it always seems to be something. And these people who had come from all over the United States and some other countries who didn't know each other, but there we were. And we were one body, we were one fellowship, it was one church. And not all the people out there were believers, but they were all hungry for God because they had come and paid the price. And that price for many of them was thousands of dollars to get there. And so we fellowshiped on the steps and outside the auditorium until finally uh, at 10 o'clock they opened the doors. Then for five minutes, it was a stampede. Every seat, every windowsill, every step was taken. There wasn't a room for one more. The service would begin around 2 o'clock. Why? We were crazy, weren't we? Waiting with such anticipation and joy. You didn't mind. It didn't seem like a long time at all. Finally, 10 o'clock would come and her uh, first, her p pianist would come out and he would start playing these worship and praise songs and then her organist would come out and he would join him. Finally, Catherine would come out on the stage. She always said, and have you been waiting for me? I remember I was in Haiti and uh, we had a visitation. The Lord came to the motel where we were staying visited us. Oh, the glory of the presence of the Lord. I'm sorry. There was nothing you could do but worship all night fall on the floor, lift up your hands, give yourself to him. You're going to Israel, he said. He said, when you're in Israel, look, and I looked, and he showed me, and I was sitting in a seat, I think it was the second row, in the gallery that went around the platform. I was just over the platform, on the right hand side here and there I was sitting there and I looked down from this seat up there Catherine came out on the stage she walked right over to where I was and lifted up her eyes and looked at me she said and have you been waiting for me the Lord taught me a song pray song I got to Israel some time later. I went to the services. I sat in that seat. Catherine came out on that stage, walked over to where I was, looked up. Have you been waiting for me? Exactly as I had seen it in the vision. And the song that he taught us there in Haiti that I sang for two days, I saw his majesty as Jesus spoke to me. And a couple from Canada were there. And they walked out on the stage and the announcer had sort of said, we don't know what they're going to sing. But they started singing. What did they sing? I saw his majesty as Jesus spoke to me. Jesus wants us to see his majesty. He's real. He's wonderfully real. But the voices in the world, there are so many voices. They're demanding our attention all the time. 
so, so difficult to walk down the street and not see people coming at you with their telephone at their ear, wherever you go. We want to hear the voice of the Lord. We want to see Him. Hallelujah. Praise your name. I'm just going to read here of some of the descriptions as I have put several scriptures together and not have you turn to them all. Amen. He's clothed in white garments. He was like fire. His loins were girded with the pure gold of Euphas. His body was a golden luster like world. His face, the appearance of lightning. I can't imagine that. It would be terrifying, wouldn't it? His eyes were flames of torches. His arms and feet were glowing, burnished, bright, bronze. Fire round about and within. His waist ah, was fire and so forth. Downward fire. His words, the noise of a multitude, the roaring of the sea, his name, the name of the Lord, comes from burning, comes from afar with burning and anger. His lips are full of indignation. His tongue is like a consuming fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches to the neck. The Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. Uh, I sang in the choir and played in the orchestra when I was studying at Moody in Chicago. And at Christmas time we did the Messiah, Handel's Messiah, which is glorious. And uh, we were about an hour into the performance in a big choir, about 400 people in a full orchestra. And I was standing up there in the top row and singing. And it was just wonderful. And I was just drinking it all in and rejoicing. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. And the Lord said to me, Art, what do you think about all this? And he sort of took me off for a second and I looked around the auditorium and I listened to the choir singing in the orchestra. And I said, oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, you want to know what I think? <laughs> I said, yes, Lord. I said, compared to the voices of the angels, oh, um, no. 144,000 harps. Yeah. I said, oh Lord, I understand. It's just noise. The best we can do. It's just noise. And there was silence. <coughs> then after a few seconds, the Lord spoke again. And he said, yes. But I love it. Amen. Oh. When we give our best, it may not measure up to what someone else can do. It may never be so beautiful or great or stunning. But it's our offering. And it's the best that we can bring. And we bring it in holiness. And we lift holy hands. Our great granddaughter that we have, Mike's granddaughter, Rose. Oh, Mary, I'm sorry, Mary, you had your face down. I didn't see you there. Yeah. Uh, our great granddaughter, your daughter, your granddaughter, uh huh. She gets this big smile all over her face and lifts up her little hands. And you can't help but love her. You can't help but reach out. You want to pick her up and grab her up and kiss her and bite her. And, uh, 
how does God feel about you? Has you realized how intensely, how deeply he loves you? How important everything you do is to God. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. How's our time going? Is it 12? I didn't even get to my introduction. <laughs> just, just two minutes to finish. I'll just cut it all off. I'm going to write a book about this. You'll have to get the book. Pardon? You're going to help me. Mike's going to help me write this book. Math, um, Malachi chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Then those who feared the Lord uh, talked or called often one to another. And the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who reverenced and worshipfully feared the Lord, who thought on his name. Every time we come together, whether it's in the street or the market, we should mention the name of Jesus and exalt him. God is listening. They shall be mine. It's like me reaching down at my grand, beautiful great-granddaughter and saying, she's ours. She's wonderful. Yeah. They shall be mine, God says, the Lord of hosts. In that day when I publicly recognize and openly declare them to be my jewels, my special possession, my peculiar treasure, I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. And what's coming on the United States right now, God's going to spare his children. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. In the middle of all the chaos and the confusion, when people are running here, we will walk in an ocean of peace Enjoy with our eyes on Jesus, knowing that he is the answer. He not only has the answer, he is the answer. And whether it's food you need or transportation or whatever it is, he's there. Until Jesus, our wonderful transport, catches us up to meet him in the air, which will be very soon. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for our dear, dear brothers and sisters, Pastor for the privilege of being here and sharing together. We didn't get into the message, really. But Lord, you know, and let your Holy Spirit continue as you talk to individual and in, in each heart. Bring forth your message to each of us. We want to hear your voice. Yes. And we love you. Yes. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord, I love you. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, whatever God has said to you or done for you, hold on to it. We have an enemy. He's a thief. He'd like to steal. He came to steal. Carl. In the spirit, I see wonderful things for you. You hold on to it. Don't go back. Don't let go of it. Don't speak in doubt, fear, worry. No, just keep praising, praising you and your dear wife. Thank you, Jesus. No. God's got a house for you. Everything you need, he's got it. He's got it. Jeremiah's going to help you pray that way with faith in his heart. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah, your verse is uh, chapter 33. Verse 3. Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah 33. Who can say it by heart? Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. 
you know, when I was in uh, seventh, eighth grade, I don't know, I, at the time I didn't know, but this, these thoughts about Nova Scotia came to me so powerfully. And I had to write a theme paper, and I wrote about Nova Scotia. But I didn't go to the encyclopedia. <laughs> I wrote out of my imagination. <laughs> and I told all about this beautiful place and so forth. Yeah. And that stayed with me for about two years. I don't know why. God knew why. Because later on, about what, eight years later, seven, eight years later, he called me to Nova Scotia. And Joan and I went there ministered and lived. No. God has ways that are beyond us. You be listening. You be watching so that you can hear what God is saying. See what he's showing you. This is the way you'll hear this Holy Spirit say, walk ye in it. And obey that. Do what God calls you to do. Okay, that's enough.